think to network. Let me just start by saying good morning. All right, I know it's 8 o'clock. I know it's Thursday. But this is going to be very invigorating. So, and even if it's not, you better act invigorated. <laughs> so let's start again. Good morning. Good morning. Love it, love it, love it. I'm Ruth Hassel Thompson. A lot of people will refer to me as Senator because for 16 years I was New York State Senator representing Westchester and the Bronx and took and take a lot of responsibility and pleasure in having been the Senate side author of the MWBE legislation that has gone forth under um, first David Patterson and then Andrew Cuomo, um, which gives me bragging rights and a little bit of background knowledge about what we're gonna talk about today. I'd like to do just a little bit of housekeeping first and uh, just say that this, good morning, Seth. Um, one of the key people that, that mentored me through this process. But I'd, I'd like to do just a little housekeeping first and say that this uh, panel is going to last until about 9, 10, and we have to leave as quickly as possible unless those of you are going to stay for the next workshop. And out of courtesy to them, if you want to talk with either Philip or myself, can we do it outside the room so that the next workshop can, in fact, start on time and uninterrupted? Because an hour is really not a long time, and so that they're going to be pressed uh, to get all, all the things done that they want to do. And um, let me segue into a little promo for that workshop. It is um, immediately following in this room. It's called Navigating Transitions and transformation, the next generation of women leaders. And it is about young women who are coming into the construction and development era and the kinds of things that they have an interest in and where they want to be and the goals that they want to set and what they think the work environment they would like to see happen. So that will be the workshop that will be immediately following um, Okay, Renee, I've done my job. Now, on to this panel. We are here today to discuss the new disparity study and the report. And this is what the disparity study um, ultimately uh, looks like in its, in its final form. And in it is this particular copy. You can download it from ESD and go to Disparity Study, and it is available online. Um, mine is a very nice bound copy, and that's up to you if you want to do all that work. But the point is that it needs to be read, and it needs to be read by someone in your firm, if not by you, because it will tell you the, the, what the landscape potentially will look like when we get to the point of statutory as well as regulatory. And for those of you who don't understand that language, statute is that which we do once we enact the law, and then it becomes the statute of the state. Regulatory is that which the agencies put together as a as a day-to-day -day guide. And so that we try very, very hard, at least I do, to make sure that the language of the statutory finds its way into the regulatory. Because sometimes we have some folks that work that are career folk and the intent of the legislation somehow does not get properly translated. And so we're working diligently to ensure that we go from the statutory to the regulatory and what the intent, what our intent is, is carried out. The Croson versus Richmond decision is the basis in case law used to define the parameters by which government can establish a goals program to assist MWBEs and other 
disadvantaged groups to achieve economic parity in state contracting opportunities. There are two lines of inquiry that make this possible. The first approach investigates active government discrimination or acts of exclusion that are committed by representatives of the government entities. I need a tissue. So. Is there a napkin? Sorry. It's the air conditioning wreaks havoc with my sinuses. I apologize. Thank you. Um, the second line of inquiry examines government's passive support of discriminatory practices in the market area where its funds are infused. Passive exclusion occurs when government contracts are awarded to companies that discriminate against MWBEs or where government fails to take corrective measures to prevent discrimination by prime contractors. Thus, the disparity study experts explored through a series of personal interviews and other methods of inquiry the barriers that MWBEs experienced in their attempts to secure contracts with the state of New York. Why is this important? Well, there first must be an understanding about how government must position itself in order to make the programs work effectively. And secondly, to ensure that the conclusion that's drawn does not create reverse discriminatory barriers and can withstand constitutional scrutiny. Now people say, well, you know, we've had a problem in the state of New York, everybody's aware of it. Yes, we are. But the extent of the problem, how to quantify it, and therefore how to qualify it, and there to codify and correct it, thus the disparity study becomes important. Because what it allows us to do is look at history, past practices, and to see what role government has played in creating passive or active participation in discriminating against those of color and, gender, and by gender. It's also critical to understand that having a majority of the vote, which was the mistake that Richmond made in thinking that they had the majority of votes, that that was sufficient and that they had the data in their heads in order to be able to put a goals program or a quota program in place having known the mayor of Richmond at the time that this occurred, <laughs> we tried to encourage him to understand the importance of doing a disparity study so that conclusively we could go to court and defend any goals program that might be put in place. Unfortunately, they did not choose to do so. Thus, today, we are grappling with how do we ensure that we have equity and participation in all government contracts. And through a disparity study, we discover the true extent of what this disparity is and hopefully develop remedies that government can use in a consistent and fair-handed way to ensure that that participation happens, but that we do not in the process create reverse discrimination against gender, or color. The panel discussion, which is very limited between Philip and myself, is specifically designed to walk you through the disparity study to answer questions that you may have. And our presenter, Mr. Philip Harmonek, who is assistant counsel to Empire State Development and who has been the chief analyst of our disparity study, um, he has, well, the findings of the disparity study will be his role today to help to explain to you, as he has done with me, and I thank him for that. And he will be working very closely with the legislature as we promulgate the language required to make this law and to create the regulations for facilitation by all of the state agencies. I give you Philip Harmonek. 
Good morning. Good morning. Before I start the, the formal talk about the disparity study, I just want to recognize what an extraordinary privilege it is to share the stage with Senator Hassel Thompson. Um, in addition to her role in shaping the modern program as it stands today, Senator Hassel Thompson is truly a thought leader on the subject of MWBE growth and development. I can say uh, without qualification that every time I speak with Senator Hassel Thompson, I walk away with ideas about how we could improve and transform this program that, that no one else is talking about. Truly, it is a privilege to share the stage with Senator Hassel Thompson. Now, some of the information that we're going to present may seem a little bit abstract, but it's incredibly important to the continuation of the MWBE program. As you may have heard yesterday, the MWBE program expires at the end of 2018. The disparity study is both the basis for the reauthorization of the law and a roadmap towards the development of what the program will look like in the future if it, in, if it indeed continues into the future, which we must ensure that it does. Before we start with the talk about the disparity study, we have to recognize the ebook of contract opportunities, which should have been made available to you already. It's an incredible resource for learning about upcoming opportunities for you to participate in state contracts. I urge all of you to examine it closely. What is a disparity study and why do we need one? Senator Hassel Thompson began the discussion about uh, Croson. And, and what it means for disparity studies. But I want to talk about it a little bit more, uh, as I have in all presentations that I give about the disparity study. It informs why we need one and why disparity studies are structured as they are. In the 1980s, the city of Richmond reviewed the demographics of its city, the residents, and based on that analysis, uh, compared its, its demographics to the actual utilization of minority and women-owned business enterprises in city contracting. And the city of Richmond found an incredible disparity. The residents of the city of Richmond were very diverse. The businesses doing business with the city of Richmond were not. Based on that information alone, that intuitive understanding of, uh, of disparity and uh, lack of opportunities, the city of Richmond developed its MWBE program, which was challenged by a group of contractors doing business in and around the city of Richmond. That case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court struck down the city of Richmond's program. The court held that just comparing demographics to the utilization of firms in, in state, city, local contracting is not adequate. The comparison needs to be of minority and women-owned businesses' availability to their utilization in state, city, or local contracting, and that that availability needs to be tested statistically to determine whether there are explanations other than the racial composition of the owners of the businesses for their underutilization. The court held that any classification on the basis of race, even one that benefits minority group members, is inherently suspect and likely to lead to the discrimination that Senator Hassel Thompson talked about. So what do we need to have a constitutionally valid MWBE program? First, we need a compelling governmental interest. The Croson Court determined that we need statistically significant evidence that MWBEs are available to do business with government and that they're underutilized. Once we have that evidence, which is what the disparity study provides us with, then we must turn to developing a program that is narrowly tailored. Narrow tailoring, what the program is, who it benefits, how it benefits them, how goals are set on contracts, how waivers are administered is not a product of the disparity study. That goes to narrow tailoring, how the state, how the unit of government actually implements the findings of the disparity study. We're going to be focusing on data in this discussion, not implementation. It's important to understand this constitutional framework because it explains why the disparity study does not tell us how to process waivers or how to, or how to set goals on specific contracts. So what do we get out of a disparity study? The disparity study, by measuring the participation of minority group members and women in state contracting, tells us which groups we can assist and in which industries and to what extent. It tells us how much we can provide to people, what benefits we can offer, the extent of those benefits. And it provides us with recommendations on how to get there. 
but the disparity studies policy recommendations are a roadmap. For those of you returning to New York City, you have many roads that you can choose to take back to the city. You can take, uh, the, 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 you can take a toll road, you can take a state road, you can take a train. Any of them will get you where you want to go. In narrowly tailoring the MWBE program, we can take high cost, high intensity approaches to remedying the disparity quickly, and we can take low impact approaches that, that remedy the disparity over time. So long as we stay within the confines of that roadmap, the choice that we make is up to us. The disparity study covers a number of topics. It compares the utilization of MWBEs as both prime and subcontractors to that of non-MWBEs. This is very different from the 2010 MWBE disparity study. The 2010 disparity study combined prime and subcontractors together into one group, didn't distinguish between them. This study, in breaking the two apart, provides us with very interesting evidence that will inform the policy recommendations that we'll be discussing as we move along. The study, of course, must measure the availability of MWBEs in the state's contracting market, and we'll talk a little bit about how MWBEs were identified. The study tests the significance of disparities between availability and utilization and measures whether there are other explanations besides the racial composition of the ownership of businesses that better explain those disparities. The study also includes policy recommendations, as we discussed, for narrowly tailoring the program and enhancing its benefits in the future, including a first-of-its-kind evaluation of the personal net worth requirement for MWBE certification. And most excitingly of all to me, this study includes a first-of-its-kind workforce study measuring millions of hours of work by minority group members and women as employees of state contractors. We'll talk a little bit more about the ramifications of that new study, never before done study, as we move through the presentation. The study measured the utilization of MWBEs in state contracting uh, during the contracting period that you can see on screen right now. You can also see the utilization results. Uh, within the respective industries on screen. Construction, vertical and horizontal construction, construction-related services, which includes architecture, engineering, environmental testing, surveying, what have you. Non-construction services, this includes legal, accounting, financial, and commodities, the purchase of goods. Across the board, MWBE utilization is higher than it was in 2010. You heard the exciting news that during the last year, MWB utilization exceeded 27%. You can see that we've made tremendous progress in this program, particularly under the leadership of Governor Cuomo and Lourdes Zapata, the director of the Division of Minority and Women's Business Development. Tremendous progress. You'll also note that there are wide differences, wide gulfs in the utilization of MWBEs by industry. And you'll notice that those gulfs are greatest at the prime contractor level. We're doing very well at integrating MWBEs into some prime contracting industries, but not as well in others. Those numbers are more level at the subcontractor level, and we'll discuss what that means as we move through the study. Now, in order to test MWBE disparity, you need to measure availability to compare against utilization. Mason Tillman, the contractor that completed the disparity study, utilized a number of methods to identify firms ready, willing, and able to do business with the state. First, Mason Tillman reviewed contracting records. There's no better evidence that a firm is ready, willing, and able to do business with the state than actually having done so. Mason Tillman exhaustively examined state contracting records to find firms that actually had done business with the state. Mason Tillman also uh, reviewed uh, bid results and bidders lists to determine uh, which firms had unsuccessfully sought to do business with the state. Mason Tillman consulted um, trade membership lists, organizational membership lists, and directories, including the division's directory of certified MWBEs, directories of small businesses, service-disabled veteran-owned businesses, and, and so forth. Mason Tillman supplemented this information with surveys to better understand the services that MWBEs and non-MWBEs identified through these records were providing. Based on this exhaustive analysis, Mason Tillman found the levels of MWBE availability that you can see on screen right now. This is exponential growth from the, the results of the 2010 disparity study, which found MWBE availability at 28.92%. MWBEs are forming, growing, and flourishing at rates that they were not 
in 2010. This is both um, an endorsement of the excellent efforts of Lourdes Zapata and the division, and a sign that the state is creating opportunities that are allowing MWBEs that form to stay in business long enough to be captured as available in these disparity studies. Now, just finding that we have 53% availability and lower utilization is not enough in of itself to demonstrate a statistically significant disparity. Mason Tillman also examined whether other parameters besides the ownership of these businesses was a better predictor of whether or not the firms would win a state contract. Mason Tillman compared the likelihood of winning a state contract based on the racial, ethnic, or gender composition of the ownership of businesses to the number of employees of businesses, the educational attainment of the owners of businesses, the annual revenue of businesses. None of these factors was a better predictor of whether a business wins a state contract than the gender, racial, or ethnic composition of its ownership. This is the compelling governmental interest that we need, the proof that we need to maintain the MWBE program, to reauthorize the MWBE program going into the future. This, these, this comparison of other parameters actually yielded data that demonstrated that minority group members and women who owned businesses tended to have higher educational attainment than their non-minority male counterparts, and for some racial and ethnic groups, higher levels of employment on average uh, than, than non-minority male-owned businesses. This addresses uh, complaints, concerns from some individuals in the, the contracting community that MWBEs in the aggregate lack the capacity to do business with the state. Although there are some outlier non-minority uh, non male-owned businesses that are certainly larger than most MWBEs, the average MWBE's capacity is indistinguishable from the average non-minority owned male business uh, capacity. Now, the study found strong evidence of disparity across the board as prime and subcontractors for most racial and ethnic groups as well as Caucasian women. That provides us with the compelling governmental interest that we need to continue to provide benefits to these groups, to set goals for subcontractor participation, as well as to enhance opportunities for MWBEs as prime contractors. One of the interesting findings in this disparity study was that opportunities for MWBE prime contractors, their utilization relative to their availability was significantly lower than subcontractors. In some cases, many times lower. We're doing a very poor job of helping MWBEs graduate to being prime contractors and getting them work as prime contractors. This study needs to focus our attention on addressing that issue in the reauthorization of the law. The evidence was mixed for some racial and ethnic groups. This study took the unique approach, which the 2010 study did not, of measuring Asian Indian individuals and Asian Pacific individuals separately, rather than having one single category of Asian-owned business enterprises. Asian Pacific-owned business enterprises were significantly underutilized in every category of state contracting. Asian Indian-owned businesses were underutilized as prime contractors and underutilized as construction subcontractors but in some cases overutilized in the construction-related services and professional services field. This has to have an impact on the reauthorization of the law and our analysis of the narrow tailoring of the MWBE program. The study also found mixed evidence for Native American-owned businesses. Uh, one of the great challenges in measuring the uh, participation of Native American-owned businesses in state contracting is their relatively low availability. There were so few Native American-owned businesses in some industries that they could not be tested at a statistically significant level. This also has impacts for the narrow tailoring of the MWB program. It's something that the legislature and the governor are going to need to consider carefully in structuring how program benefits are structured going forward. In addition to measuring disparities for MWBEs, the study also included the first of its kind workforce study that I mentioned. Now measuring availability for workforce is actually quite simple because the US Census Bureau has done the work for us. Through its periodic American community surveys, the Census Bureau has measured the availability of minority group members and women in every trade and profession that the state requires in its state contracting. You can see that availability on screen right now. It's enormous, it's extremely high. In order to compare that availability to the state's utilization, 
the Division of Minority and Women's Business Development exhaustively through workforce utilization reports required contractors to report on every employee they deployed on state contracts during the study period and to organize them by standard occupational classification codes so that they could be compared to the availability of minority group members and women to do business as employees. What that, what that study found were that were significant disparities across the board for minority group members and women as employees. This could form the basis for a workforce program that incentivizes contractors to deploy diverse workforces when hired to do business with the state. One of the incredibly interesting findings, which you will see if you read through the workforce volume of the disparity study posted on ESD's website, is the incredible disparity for women in the, in the workforces deployed by contractors. There are certainly disparities on the basis of race and ethnicity, but within racial and ethnic groups, disparities are multiplied many times over for women. That needs to affect any policy that's derived from these results. Any policy, any program built on these results needs to pay special attention to how program benefits will assist women because of their incredible underutilization. Now, with these results and in keeping with the theme of this forum, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about transformation. The reauthorization of the law does not need to simply copy and paste the existing Article 15A into uh, a bill, into legislation, and pass. We can transform this program. We can take the information contained in the disparity study and really think critically about how to help MWBEs reach parity, receive their fair share of state contracting. I'm gonna talk about a couple of the recommendations that the study proposed uh, and on a variety of categories, starting with prime contractors. You may recall that the disparities for prime contractors are much greater than for subcontractors. We still need a program for subcontractors. We still have that statistically significant evidence, but the evidence is incredibly strong for prime contractors. How are we going to remedy that? One recommendation from the disparity study is bidding credits. The state finance law already authorizes state agencies to take into account MWBE certification status when awarding best value contracts, contracts on a basis that are awarded on the basis of both quality and cost. But on low bid contracts, there is no such qualification. Your MWBE certification status does you no good when responding to low bid prime contracts. Mason Tillman recommends assigning a bidding credit of up to 10% for MWBEs uh, when responding to low bid prime contracts. To illustrate how that would work, if an MWBE uh, responded to a solicitation from a state agency and proposed to provide a good for $100,000, that bid would be uh, 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 evaluated as if the MWBE had bid $90,000. If an MWBE and a non-MWBE both submitted a bid for $100,000, the MWBE's bid evaluated at $90,000 would win and the MWBE would be awarded that $100,000 contract. That's an extraordinary opportunity for MWBEs. It would require an amendment to the state finance law. It would require legislative action. The study also recommends reevaluating discretionary thresholds. You may have attended yesterday's session on discretionary purchasing and heard that the MTA has a much greater discretionary purchasing uh, uh, capacity up to $400,000 per one year engagement. And that the MTA has leveraged that enhanced purchasing power to dramatically increase MWBE participation at its agency. The $200,000 discretionary purchasing threshold for MWBEs for state agencies has been in place for quite some time. $200,000 does not buy what it did before. Reevaluating that discretionary purchasing threshold would give agencies greater leverage to award contracts to MWBEs outside of the formal RFP process. The study also recommends evaluating barriers uh, in, in the actual qualification requirements when responding to RFPs and invitations for bid. The very essence of MWBE underutilization in prime contracting is that MWBEs have been excluded from access to credit from business opportunities to grow and expand their business to the point where they have the capacity to take on those prime jobs. Qualification requirements that reinforce those barriers that are based 
on those barriers, exclude MWBEs from obtaining opportunities, reevaluating qualification standards while still ensuring that the state is obtaining a quality product will, will give MWBs an opportunity to participate at greater levels than they do now. Finally, the study recommends revisiting preferred source offerings. Preferred sources are a group of entities, um, um, industries for the blind, the core craft prison labor program that agencies must go to first to purchase certain goods or services. Regardless of price, if they can obtain that good or service from the preferred source, they must buy it from the preferred source. Before designating a preferred source, the State Procurement Council uh, requires, uh, uh, that, uh, is required to conduct an analysis of the impact of the designation on MWBEs and other small businesses. The study recommends a reevaluation of those designations to ensure that MWBEs and other small businesses are not being disproportionately affected by those designations. Goals, goals. The disparity study does not recommend any particular goals for MWBE participation on state contracting. That's, that's an issue that goes to narrow tailoring. It, it flows from each particular engagement. But what it is pointing us to is ensuring that each group of MWBEs shares equally in subcontracting opportunities. We've talked a little bit about how the results of the disparity study do not reflect that that is the case across the board. There are extraordinary disparities, particularly for African-American owned and Hispanic and Latino owned businesses as subcontractors in the professional services and construction related services industries. Consult the disparity study and you'll see those results. We need to ensure that in addition to achieving our MWBE participation goals, that all MWBEs, regardless of their racial or ethnic status, are given equal opportunity to participate on state contracts. It goes to the narrow tailoring of the program, but it's something we need to closely examine in structuring how MWBEs will set goals and measure achievement of those goals on state contracts. We also need to focus on strategic industries. Um, achieving an MWBE participation goal is, is, is not enough if we achieve it in the same industries year after year after year. The Division of Minority and Women's Business Development is exploring how Opportunities can be created for MWBEs in new and innovative strategic industries where they've never participated before. That's something we're going to be closely examining in the reauthorization of the law and in how we set goals moving forward. We're also going to be talking about how we can enhance MWBE participation monitoring, not just with respect to achieving goals, but with respect to prompt payment, ensuring that MWBEs aren't going out of business, waiting for that paycheck to come in, uh, and how to deal with substitution. Something that we hear quite a bit about um, is, is prime contractors shuffling MWBEs during the, the performance of contracts due to inadequate monitoring by agencies. That's something else that we're going to closely examine uh, in the reauthorization of the law. Certification. It's no secret that the certification process could be faster. It's something that we're certainly focused on. Um, very closely in, in, in talking about how we can enhance this program for you, the stakeholders. In addition to making things faster, we want to increase the, the quality of the product that we're delivering, the certification. One way that we can do that is by building information into the certification process that will allow agencies and prime contractors to know more about what an MWBE's capabilities and capacity are just by looking at their certification profile. We're going to be discussing how we can establish MWBE qualifications through the certification process, how your certification can communicate to the world what it is that you're qualified to do more specifically, what specializations you have, what licenses you have, what you can do for prime contractors and for state agencies. We're also going to be talking about tailoring personal net worth requirements. The study certainly indicates that for some capital intensive industries, for some industries where uh, MWBE businesses rely on their owner's personal net worth to obtain credit or bonding, that the personal net worth requirement can be an impediment to MWBE growth and capacity. In other industries that are not capital intensive, where MWBE business owners do not need to use that personal net worth to obtain bonding, perhaps that's less of a concern. The study is guiding us towards a more tailored personal net worth requirement, not necessarily a single $3.5 million threshold for all, but one that takes into account industry considerations. It is more tailored to the communities that are affected by that certification. 
Finally, we need to, to streamline the certification process. We need to make it quicker. We need to ask for the right documents that will allow us to determine eligibility, and as I said before, inform contractors and agencies of what MWBE capabilities actually are. Growth. We need to encourage sustainable growth. We need to encourage MWBEs to move from subcontractors to prime contractors and to provide them with, with a ramp, if you will, for exiting the, the subcontractor portion of the program and moving into prime contracting. We need to create incentives for agencies to do business with firms that, that have maybe graduated out of the program or that have moved solely into uh, the status of, or primarily into the status of doing business as prime contractors. In the reauthorization of the law, we need to look closely at how we're establishing incentives for agencies to continue doing business with MWBEs once they've grown out of narrow subcontracting roles or graduated from the program. We also need to provide support for mentorship and joint ventures. Um, you may go quite a ways in your business before you're ready to establish a joint venture uh, with another firm. It's, it's quite an undertaking. But once you're ready, the incentives need to be there to encourage prime contractors to partner with you and to, to solicit business with the state directly with you. Whether through economic incentives or goal evaluation, we need to establish the incentives for the state agencies to reward prime contractors that mentor MWBEs and that form joint ventures with MWBEs. And finally, we need to provide direct training and technical assistance. The MTA is already pioneering these efforts. Uh, we need other agencies to follow suit, and we need to provide the resources to those agencies to provide that necessary training and technical assistance. Workforce. This is a very exciting topic. It's something entirely new. We've never had a workforce program like, uh, like the study contemplates in this state. There really isn't a workforce program like the study contemplates anywhere in the nation. The disparity study has produced incredible evidence of the underutilization of minority group members and women as employees in order for us to share the benefits of economic development that are being provided by the state equally among all communities. We can't focus just on business owners. We need to focus on employees as well. The study doesn't tell us how to structure our program. But we are thinking about how to, to assign incentives to contractors to do business with the state with a diverse workforce. That could come in the form of goals, like our existing MWBE program. It could come in the form of uh, incentives uh, through best value evaluations and responses to RFPs, depending on the project team. The negotiations with the legislature need to carefully take into account how to structure those incentives, keeping in mind that not all industries are the same. Not all firms are responding the same way to state opportunities. Not all opportunities will give the state equal opportunity to measure who's actually going to be deployed at the outset of a project. We need to take those particularities into account. We need to take the specific findings in the disparity study about the underutilization of minority group members in some trades and professions more than others into account in structuring that relief. It's a nuanced, careful discussion that may require multiple tools, not one single tool. But at the end of the day, we want to be able to say that we're providing incentives to contractors to deploy a workforce that mirrors the availability of minority group members and women across all of the trades and professions required in state contracting. What we need from everyone here who sees value in these uh, proposed changes in the MWBE program at all to, to contact their legislators, to inform them of, of what importance they see in this program and what changes here or elsewhere uh, that they've seen that they'd like to see in the new reauthorized Article 15A. This is an incredible opportunity for you to participate in the policymaking process, and I hope you'll all engage actively and aggressively uh, to, to build this program into something even better than it ever has been before. At that point, uh, Senator Hassel Thompson, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Notice something. Outside of the outline, he never used notes for the entire piece. You know, Philip gave me um, a great shout out earlier, and I want to say to him that um, it has been a pleasure to work with him too during this short window that we've had.
between the submission of the disparity study and the briefing that he has given to me and to members of the legislature. And I think he has done an extraordinary job. And as, as I listen to each presentation, sometimes this stuff can be very dry. But he makes it alive. And um, it is clear that not only has he ingested this, but he has really done a tremendous job to do an analysis of where we are, where we were, and certainly where we need to be going. I cannot impress upon you enough uh, that you listen very carefully to those of you who were here yesterday and heard Alfonso David talk about what the reauthorization um, is going to mean and how important it is that we get this legislation reauthorized. And you heard Philip also admonish us to ensure that we, number one, know, because I think, unfortunately, there are still a lot of people who don't know who their legislators are, and they may know who their local government people are, which is important. But it's more important right now that you understand and know who represents you in state government because that's where this is going to be, uh, this is where the wrestling is going to happen. And we need to ensure that the voice that the governor hears comes from those people who could potentially benefit. Because certainly those detractors are going, they have his ear. And they will be shouting into that ear and trying to drown out other voices. And I'm not the voice of doom, but I will tell you that I am the voice of a prophet because I've been here and done this. And I want to tell you that I've been doing this for over 40 years. And yesterday I happened to, when I walked into the exhibit hall, one of the people that I met was someone that I bet, met back in 1980. When I first started working in construction, I was the executive director of Westchester Minority Contractors Association, and I served on the National Association of Minority Contractors as their representative. And that was my first introduction to what it can mean to change the paradigm of families of color in neighborhoods and communities. And working with, Ant with Anthony Robinson and then Parent Mitchell to help to do 95-105 law 507, sorry, 507, public law. 40 years later, we're still struggling with the same issue. How do we create parity? I don't want equality, I want parity. And if you look up the difference, you will understand that there's a significant difference. I don't want equal, I want parity. And I think that we have an opportunity to um, set the bar at a very high standard in the state of New York and everybody can make money and everyone can feed families. And for me, that is what I've spent the last 40 some years of my life trying to create. And this, I think, is one of the last opportunities that we're going to have to establish who we're going to be in the state of New York. And see, New York is important not just to us because we live here, but to the rest of the country, because as New York goes, so do we, as a country. And they emulate and posture what we do. And they let us struggle with all the problems. And they come in and then they say, oh, we can do that now, because New York has taught us how to do it and how to get it done. And I don't mind suffering the angst that come with attempting to get this job done. But it's going to take all of us in this room and those of you who chose to get up and be here at 8 o'clock this morning express to me that you really do understand how important what we're talking about really is. And Philip and the whole staff, Lourdes and, and certainly the entire staff there have done an extraordinary job working with Mason Tillman to be sure, number one, that we understand and we've had more opportunities, or been given more opportunities this time to really understand this disparity study than we did the last time. And it, we also have the leeway to make it 
the document that it can and should be as we move toward the statutory and regulatory development of what our government is going to do and how it's going to participate with all of its citizens in the state. So who has a burning question? And let me tell you that we've finished in record time and we have a whole 15 minutes. And, um, but I'm going to admonish you as I did the group yesterday. I am taking only questions, only questions. So who has a burning question that they need to ask me or particularly to ask Philip? Young lady in the back. There's a, mono, there's a microphone, please come up to the mic. And anybody else who is interested, there are two mics, get in line and we'll take as many questions as we can. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Sheila McQueen. I'm the owner of Scrub Clean Maintenance Corp. Um, we operate in the Bronx. Um, I've been directly affected by um, the loss of contracts with the state. Um, the, the contracts of, that used to be available to MWBEs are now being automatically awarded as sole source or preferred source vendors to the handicapped. Um, I'd like to know as a minority woman-owned business, um, I hear a lot about the 30% participation goals, and um, we're not getting any contracts. I have a binder this thick of contracts that are now being awarded to the handicapped. What does companies such as myself do to, to be able to participate in working with the state? I'm going to answer your question a little bit indirectly, because as you said, where there's a preferred source designation, state agencies need to go to the preferred source. What I want to talk about is how we could reevaluate preferred sources. The Procurement Council needs to evaluate the impact of preferred sources on, on small businesses, and particularly MWBEs, before designating any good or service to be offered through a preferred source. What the Procurement Council needs to examine closely is first, what, what impact does this have on, on MWBs and small businesses? Will they be able to obtain opportunities to do business with the state in peripheral industries? Will they be able to obtain opportunities to, to grow and sustain their businesses through local or private work outside of, of the state if, if this preferred source is designated as such? Or is, is the state really going to be the only market for these firms? Um, and the preferred source designation will, will really negatively impact their business. A second question is, if there is no preferred source designation, who's actually going to get the work? Will it be small businesses? Will it be MWBEs? Or will it be large, integrated, perhaps even multi-state or multinational firms that offer the good or the service? These are the questions that, that the Procurement Council has to evaluate very closely before designating or changing the designation of a preferred source. What the Procurement Council needs to do in your case is, is evaluate who's going to get the work if not for the preferred source. Is it going to be people like you or is it going to be large, vertically integrated firms that, that may be able to, to bid very competitively on some of those, those janitorial type contracts? Um, that's, a, that's a difficult question that I can't answer that really needs to be left for the Procurement Council, but that's the question that, that needs to be asked. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Gentlemen here. Good morning. My name is Gary Guleria. I'm uh, president of AG Consulting Engineering. PC is like an engineering firm I founded in 22 years ago uh, in New York City. And uh, it, was, uh, it was very good. I really appreciate it for the city and state. Everybody had, uh, I'm, an, I'm from Indian origin, and there was a, we were certified as an MBE firm with the city and state both. Mm -hmm. Then comes local law one, they took Indian minorities out of the picture and we, I did not get any work from the city at all. And then we were working with the, with the state, we tried to put a lot of effort, whatever we could, went through the tolls, blood and sweat, we did a lot. And I think we are doing good at the moment, we are known to be a good people who do, do, who do good service to the primes and to the, to the state. Now this disparity study which we saw, is taking Indian Americans, Indian subcontinent Americans out of minority. First of all, we are a, we are a minority. We are a very, very minority. And, and we, without minority, we suffered a lot on the city. I've got record to show. But we are hearing this state, it is really breaking our heart and we don't think that we will survive at all. So request is this, because we are a minority and we do a good job and we work with all the primes, 
they like us, but the thing is, moment if this thing is gone and the percentage keeps on increasing, there will be nothing left for us. Nobody will look at us at all because they will go after other minorities who can fulfill the position and will be completely eliminated. I will say 22 years ago, I started the firm and I'm moving up and I'm right at a point where I can make some difference. But I'm feeling so disheartened that I actually brought my son with me mm -hmm. that he'll be taking over the business. If this thing happens, there's nothing, no, nothing sight in sight for him also. So my kind request is, my request is this, kindly consider this thing that in all fairness, Indians, is, people are, are a minority firm. They're a minority, there are two minority, and the, we work over here, this guy born here, raised here in America, and then what is there for him? If, if they're not taken, it will be very difficult for him to move forward. So okay. that is not theory. Okay, is there anything I, for us? I hear the, okay, I hear the question is, what's possible? Yes, sir, yes ma'am. One yes. of the things that the disparity study has done is to show as, as um, Philip explained, um, who got the work, who did, who did what? Yes, yes, good move. Excuse me. Is this something we should know? Yes, there is miles running around. There's a, oh, uh, we should not have known that. <laughs> All righty. All right. We're cutting into that 15 minutes now. The, so it's a mouse, not a rat. We can handle this. We can handle this, okay? Thank you. Um, and no jumping on the tables, please. We can't change the tablecloths. We don't have that kind of money. I don't want to be diverted from your question because um, I've already been bombarded with that as a question. And let me say this to you. That's one of the reasons that it becomes important that we do the analysis of what the disparity study shows. And it will be the efforts of myself and all of us, and I don't think that I'm making a mistake when I say this, Lourdes, that we will be making sure that no one is hurt by these findings, but they're but if you'll remember, when we did the disparity study before, the net worth became a problem. And particularly for many of the women-owned businesses who had assets that were inherited or through divorce or whatever, could have impact their ability to remain in the minority, in the minority or women category. Our objective here is to ensure that we put the greatest level of resources for those firms who have not been able to participate and to ensure that there is more evenness in the way in which our contracts are let. And if I'm saying anything that's out of kilter, I'm depending upon the two of them on either side of me to give me some hint. But I will say to you that um, we're, I think I prefaced this whole thing earlier by saying this is an attempt to ensure that everybody eats. And so that these are things that will be taken into consideration as we get to the regulations and to the legislative portion. But I have to tell you that if government is going to expend funds, time, and effort it must be on those firms who have yet to meet the threshold of parity. Is that fair? I'm looking at you because do you, you do understand the argument. If not, we'll talk about it some more. But because I think that that's very important to understand. The government is in the business of helping those who need help. And so those businesses that have been chronically disadvantaged are those who these programs were designed to assist. Is that fair? It, it is. OK. Do, do you mind if I so, so that's kind of where we are. But it will not be our attempt or effort to hurt anyone who wishes to do business with the state of New York. 
Next question. Let's go back to the back. Thank you, very, thank you very much for a very thorough presentation. Um, you talked a bit about how um, the study found underutilization in prime contracts. But given that prime contracts are awarded based on state finance law, a majority of them by um, low bid, could you explain a little bit about where the discrimination is in yes. that? Absolutely. Uh, Senator Hassel Thompson talked at the beginning of, of the presentation about there being two kinds of, of discrimination that we need to look at. Discrimination by the state and passive participation in discrimination by the state in the form of providing funds to prime contractors that are themselves engaging in discrimination. Our subcontracting goals are by and large addressing the passive participation in, in discrimination. What this study is calling on us to look at is how the state finance law, how the way that state agencies structure procurements, how state agencies choose prime vendors is having an impact on MWBE communities and whether the actual award criteria themselves are, are, um, are, are tainted by historical barriers to MWBE participation in state contracting. It's not an indictment of prime contractors, uh, non-minority male prime contractors, that MWBE prime contractors aren't getting enough contracts. It's, it's an indictment of exactly the state finance law and the award uh, mechanisms that, that you referred to. We need to make sure that our award mechanisms give the state the value it needs in the construction space, promote safety and quality, but at the same time are not unduly restrictive to firms that have not had the same opportunities historically to build their businesses and gain opportunities doing business with the state or anyone else. Gentleman here in the front. Yes, good morning. My name is Captain Edmund Williams. My company is Williams Petroleum Marine Group. We are a licensed marine contractor and we're very interested in the expansion that you're, you're doing with the waterways in New York and New York State. However, it is difficult for small companies like my company to break into that uh, strategic area of maritime and marine work that you're currently doing, mm -hmm. especially with the waterways projects that you're having. You have so many new ferry terminals that are opening up, but there are no minorities who are capable of moving into that ferry uh, operations. We have the ability to have uh, tugs, barges, we have uh, naval architects graduating from SUNY Maritime. We have all of these classifications of professionals, business ready, in business, but the opportunity is few and far between for us to move in. The, the, the Canal Authority has, the New York Power Authority has taken over the Canal Authority. There are many opportunities for us to move into upstate New York but it's tough. How can you help to open up those doors for us? One of the challenges in, in presenting about the disparity study is you, you're a business owner. You're concerned about your industry. The disparity study is a, is a holistic study of the state's contracting market. It is not going to provide us with a roadmap for telling us how, how NIPA should, should address canal issues. It's just not. That is not what the study is intended to do. Now, that goes to the narrow tailoring of the program. How are we structuring benefits to MWBEs in, in the respective industries? That's an important discussion, incredibly important, but it's not one that the disparity study can, can guide. And, and I know that's not a satisfying answer, but... Yeah, but those are disparity areas that we're looking at, so that's why I brought up the question. Sure. It's, it's a good question. But the analysis of opportunities in markets is one that's conducted by state agencies and the actual implementation of the program. The opportunities that they create for MWBEs through their contracts is, is something that they do as part of their program implementation. We at the central state level cannot prescribe what the opportunity should be in every single one of the thousands of industry categories the state uh, requires. It's, it's beyond our capability and beyond what a disparity study needs to do. Okay, however, so we will, however. Having said that, okay. those of us who are on the policy development side will take that piece into consideration as we look at within industries. There are subsets of industries that we have not explored, um, and it can be taken into consideration. I would, I would remind you that there are people here today whose card you should get and you should bombard them with making sure that the industry that you have 
the deepest concern about is in fact taken into consideration. Thank you very much. Gentleman in the back, and Hi. we have the lady who's standing in the back, and that will be the last two questions. So this is a question about the study itself. Earlier you said that there was a 53% availability. Could you explain to us how that percentage is computed? It's 53% of people, 53% of volume of work, what work is counted off, 53% of companies, regardless yeah. of size. How is that measured? Because when I try to recruit MBE firms in the particular areas that I'm working on mm -hmm. in construction-related services, I certainly don't find 53% availability. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. You, you are not going to find 53% availability in every industry that the state, does, that, that the state requires contractors, or, or even many of the industries. In, in calculating availability, Mason Tillman is, is really doing a headcount of, of firms, of firms themselves in the industries uh, that, that the state requires for contracting purposes. We're not taking into account gas stations or retailers. We're looking at firms uh, that by North American Industrial Classification System codes, NAICS codes, mm. are doing business in the same industries that the state requires. Mason Tillman used the methods that, that I talked about during the presentation, contracting records, bidding records, uh, outreach to trade associations and directories to find who's out there, who's actually seeking to do business with the state, ready, willing, and able to do business with the state. It's a head count of those firms. Now in measuring who actually is, in measuring the disparity, there isn't an analysis, <coughs> pardon me, an analysis of capacity. There is an analysis of, of capacity in measuring disparity, but not just for the purposes of measuring availability. Availability is at the end of the day, a head count of firms within the industries that the state requires. We are not recommending that any agency set 53% goals on any particular contract. That would be contrary to what the study is sure. recommending. Sure, right, but the, but the availability is not an issue, to, to disagree with you for a second, availability is not an issue of head count alone. There's capacity yes. issues, right, that yes. count a lot. There may be a lot of people that yes. are available, but they can't really execute yeah. the kind of work that you need the help on. So, yes. it's, so a, it's a more nuanced issue, right? It's challenging. So what no, we're it's looking not a at nuance. If, if, if they don't exist in your particular area of the industry, that's what waivers are about. I agree. But, the, but the objective here is not to willy-nilly give waivers. The, of course. the objective is to ensure that if, in fact, you are part of a growing industry, see, part of the concern that I've had is that we're not doing business trends and we're not helping businesses. People want to jump into that which is easy. It's like saying, okay, well, law schools are full every year. Well, we don't need that many lawyers, but we might need doctors or we might need some others. So if you've got talent,